So uh, first, I'm going to talk about um, what what a woman faced what a woman faced when she first would tell her family that she wanted to be a doctor back in the Victorian era. So today. Uh, when a woman announces that she wants to be a doctor, she's met with cheers and praise, uh, congratulations and admiration, right? Everyone loves it. It's basically like shorthand for making your parents proud, right? The big becoming a doctor, like that's the thing. Um, this wasn't this wasn't the case in the Victorian era. <laughs> Actually, quite the opposite. Um, so women interested in what was considered the grotesque practice of medicine were seen as deranged. Uh, there's something wrong with them. They were traitors to their gender. They faced intense social so, social scorn, um, societal ostracism. Uh, their families even disowned them in many cases. It was it was rough. So uh, let's go back here. When Marie Zakshevska graduated from medical school in 1856, she was I would say the third or fourth woman in the U.S. Um, She's in the book a little bit. Um, her father said, uh, she like wrote to him all proud and everything, right? And her father responded, um, if she were his son, he would feel nothing but satisfaction and pride. But since she was his daughter, all he could do was grieve and weep. So then we have Eliza Mosher. When she told her parents that she wanted to become a doctor, her mother said she'd sooner see her in a lunatic asylum than in medical school. Well, these these families were not not supportive, not 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 cool with this. Um, uh, Rosalie Slaughter Morton's two brothers were both doctors, um, but their wealthy family was appalled at the idea of a woman, woman earning money. Uh, so she had to wait until her father died before she could enroll in medical school and pursue her dream. And as for Bertha Van Heusen, the thought of a doctor for a daughter caused her mother's to burst out crying every time it came up. So uh, she had to stop bringing the topic up. Uh, her father refused to pay for her medical school tuition, but she she finally went, you know, on her own without any help from her family. So when Lizzie Garrett announced her aspirations to become a physician, who was one of the main characters in my book, uh, her mother flew into a month-long depressive episode and fell ill from so much uh, crying. So this was this was rough. Uh, this was not something you went into lightly. This was uh, a big big deal. This is not something women women did. And so their families uh, were, were just not accepting of it at all. These are just a few of the outrageous stories that I uncovered while researching my book, Women in White Coats, How the First Women Doctors Changed the World of Medicine. There's the uh, UK cover uh, and the Polish edition. It's also uh, been in Italian and Chinese. I haven't gotten those covers yet though. Um, so the book is about three of the first women to earn Western medical degrees. Um, Elizabeth Blackwell was the first MD to practice in America. Lizzie Garrett Anderson was the first licensed physician practicing in England. And Sophia Jex Blake was the first woman MD to practice in Scotland. So after they struggled through a sea of sexism along the way, these three unlikely friends banded together to establish a medical school just for women, women in the UK in the hopes of ensuring that no other woman would have to endure what they did. So together they founded the London School of Medicine for Women. I love to say that my book is as inspiring as it is infuriating because it's so much about women's perseverance as it is about the sexism and misogyny thrown in their way for daring to defy the status quo. I, I love that they did it, but I hate what they had to go through to do it. I hate what why they're famous. They're famous because they had to go through all of this sexism, right? We would not know their names if this was just normal for women to become doctors at the time. They had everything going against them and very little support. So I got the idea for this book after reading about two riots. Um, they were basically exactly the same. And I was just entranced by the fact that these were like, exactly the same thing happening two different cities a year apart uh, one was in philadelphia near where i live and one was in edinburgh scotland where i actually lived for a couple of years after uh high school so both were cases of male medical students throwing these violent temper tantrums where women dared to join them in the medical school classroom so on november 6th 1869 30 students from the women's medical college of pennsylvania uh, came to a clinical lecture at the Pennsylvania Hospital. And uh, word about them coming had gotten around the, the local men's college. 
uh, and the few days before the lecture happened. So awaiting them in the amphitheater for this lecture were 300 male medical students who were it was way more than normally was there. Um, they were stomping and shouting. They were hurling epithets and cat calls. They were flinging spitballs and tobacco juice. Um, it was just gross. Uh, all that these women were trying to do was get a medical education that was just as good as the men's education. But these men saw it as women, you know, pushing into their space. This was men's space and women didn't belong there. So they had to, you know, be violent, put on a show, do something about it. So almost exactly a year later, in Edinburgh, Scotland, a drunken mob of hundreds of people, students and just citizens of, of the city, uh, were waiting outside the uh, place where they're supposed to have this exam that was going to be one of the first like um, men and women taking an exam together, right? First co-ed exam. So they're blocking the way for the women to get in, waiting for them. They're shouting again, obscenities, uh, blocking the entrance, throwing mud, throwing trash, rotten eggs and produce. So they're just getting covered in mud and gross stuff. Um, you know, a few people kind of had to like help them get into the side door, uh, usher them into the exam. They try to take the exam and the, the mob looses a sheep into the exam room later on while they're trying to take their exam. So in both of these cases, these women had to be, stay calm they could not show that these men had gotten to them, right? That would just like prove the point. Um, they couldn't show that they, they, they just couldn't provoke a reaction. They couldn't let it be seen that, that this was upsetting them. They would not be scared away this easily. So seeing all that these women went through just for trying to study medicine, just for trying to get an education, made me wanna know everything I could about them, uh, what drove them, what they were like as people, what they were hoping to accomplish. Um, so I had, to, I had to dig further, I had to know I had to find out everything I could about Victorian women, um, what they went through while trying to enter the field of medicine at this time. So what women have been practicing medicine throughout history. Uh, you know, the, the saying these were the first women doctors is kind of a misnomer because this, these are the first Western MDs, right? Women have been practicing medicine since the, the dawn of culture. Um, we know the names of several women physicians and surgeons who practiced in ancient Egypt and Greece. This is not a new thing. This is something that actually these women I'm writing about um, researched themselves and wrote papers on. Like, look, this is you know this isn't new. Women have always done this. Um, but around the Middle Ages, patriarchal control uh, came in. Medicine was transforming into a profession that needed licensure and university education. Um, so all through Europe, these lay women who were healers in, the, in villages were vilified uh, because they were the competition for the, the learned male physicians. Um, and so they were um, claimed that they were witches. And so they were burned at the stake because that, it, you know, they couldn't be the competition. Women, uh, society saw them as sort of weak imitations of men, right? They're, they're the same but lesser. Um, but by the Victorian era, society was was pretty sure that women's place was was in the home, and that's kind of where she belonged. There were spheres, right? Men had the public sphere, and women had the private sphere, and that's where they should stay. Doctors, I learned a lot about this. Doctors made up a lot of medical reasons why women should stay in their place, right? Because they had to have some sort of like science to back up uh, this the way society was. So one of the most popular um, at the time that I'm writing about is that engaging in really difficult mental or physical labor uh, would render you sterile and feeble-minded, um, make you make you you know mental, um, especially if you did this during your period. So basically, they were trying to scare women away from a higher education and professional jobs. Um, so that, you know, saying that if you did, did these things, if you went to college, that you would no longer be able to bear children anymore. And that was like your, your role, that was your expectation. But my book is also infuriating because it details the poor treatment women experience at the hands of male doctors and just how poorly male doctors understood women's illnesses. Um, these pictures illustrate how, you know, there wasn't a lot of like eye contact with uh, female anatomy. They didn't want to know what was going on. They're, you delivered a baby under blankets. You know, <laughs> it was bad news for women and, and their ailments. Um, many of the women who made the decision to go uh, against tradition and become doctors were driven uh, to this choice by watching female friends and relatives suffer 
through really agonizing illnesses, dying slow, painful deaths, uh, because they didn't want to consult a male doctor because women's illnesses were so poorly understood. Um, and because these women felt like they couldn't tell their doctors everything that they were experiencing. And some, some other the women um, who wanted to become doctors, it was because they per experienced personally a difficult pregnancy um, or a difficult birth, a stillbirth or an infant loss. So this made me feel an immediate kinship uh, because I almost died and my, my baby almost died the, when I was delivering my first son and that led to a uh, really bad postpartum depression for me. And it was that experience that made me switch my writing career. I was doing arts journalism at the time and I switched to women's health journalism. Um, so I knew exactly what it felt like to have a, a personal experience like that prompt a big shift that uh, made you want to change your careers. So many women also wanted to widen the professional and educational opportunities available to women at the time. Uh, it was, there wasn't, it was slim pickings, right? Uh, at the time, women in the upper classes um, could be a professional teacher, maybe a writer, um, you know, lower classes were doing the, the grunt work. They were working in factories. They were um, working in domestic roles and houses. Um, those, those were dangerous um, in many different ways. Uh, being a nurse was sort of considered a kind of a, a gruff old lady job, um, and, but that was starting to change during this era. It was Elizabeth Blackwell's friend, Florence Nightingale, who kind of turned nursing into a profession that was uh, now seen as selfless and romantic almost, right? Uh, but these women wanted more than just, you know, these two career choices or you know, they could have people come stay at their house. That was a lot of what women did, right? They had borders. They had to open up rooms in their house if you needed to make money, right? That's what you did. Um, they didn't just want to be passed from their father to their husband, right? Um, they didn't want to just be baby factories. They wanted to have something that was edifying them their own to, to, you know, busy them. And a lot of these women didn't want to be married. They didn't like men or they just didn't want to be married, right? So that they, they needed options as well. They need to be able to support themselves if they weren't going to get married. So these are the three women who are the main characters of the book who work together to build London School of Medicine for Women. This is the only thing I could find that had both all three of them uh, in it together. It's not really a picture of all three of them, but it's it's as close as I could get. <laughs> so they, they, each of these women, what really attracted me to the story was that these three women are so, so different. And the fact that they had to put all that aside and work together to build the school um, was, was fascinating to me. So Elizabeth Blackwell, she was the oldest by many years. She was about 10 years before um, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson uh, got her medical degree. So it was actually going to a lecture by Blackwell. Um, Elizabeth Garrett decided to become a doctor. She met Elizabeth after the lecture and kind of, she kind of talked her into it basically. Um, but she said it was sort of like electrifying to watch uh, this woman be on stage and talk about how fulfilling it was to have a job to, to you know, to feel like she had a purpose. And that's kind of what um, Elizabeth Garrett had been missing in her life. Uh, so Elizabeth Blackwell was was really eccentric. She was aesthetic. She was very like denied herself fancy things. She was, I, I like to call her an odd duck. Um, she had trouble making friends. She adopted a daughter because she was lonely and never really found a man she wanted to settle down with. Um, and Lizzie, who I refer, I refer to Elizabeth Garrett Anderson as Lizzie because there's two Elizabeths here and that was uh, a little bit confusing. So her family called her Lizzie. So in the book I, I do as well. Uh, Lizzie was very fancy, <laughs> total opposite. She liked to be seen wearing lacy dresses and she was very feminine. She didn't want people to think that becoming a doctor uh, rendered you unfeminine because that's what everyone said, right? That's what the people who were detractors of this movement said, studying medicine would make you masculine. So she made a point to be seen in public in very feminine dress. Um, she was stubborn, but she was demure. She was very ladylike. Uh, she got, she did get married. She had three kids. Uh, one of them died in infancy, um, but she even did surgery while she was pregnant. So, you know, she was the having it all, doing it all woman of the Victorian era. She, she wasn't scared. So my favorite character is Sophia Jex Blake. 
She was fat. She was opinionated. She was a loud mouth lesbian. She had a bad temper and a brilliant mind. And she just said whatever she wanted to say. And she is fabulous. <laughs> uh, she fell in love with uh, every young woman that she seemed to meet. Uh, and she's, she, she's great. <laughs> um, I like to think the book illustrates that uh, women's movements aren't a monolith, that even within these smaller movements, just this women's you know, medical education movement, there were different ideas about how to achieve collective goals. So Elizabeth and Lizzie wanted a slow, steady road to acceptance. Uh, they didn't want to step on men's toes. They knew that it was uh, important to have men you know, help them. They, they couldn't alienate all men and achieve their goals. Basically, it was, was what they thought because men, you know, were keeping holding the, the strings of all, all, the, all the institutions, right? They had to work with them. They had to be play nice if they wanted to be accepted into this institution. So but Sophia didn't, didn't think that so much. Uh, she, she didn't care at all about men's toes. Uh, she was impatient. She didn't know why she had to wait for men to get used to the idea of women, you know, being doctors, women doing things uh, in public. And like, how long would that even take? Like she, she was like, okay, we're doing this. We're doing it now. She was the, the true agitator of the group. Um, she spoke out publicly. She had her opinions published in medical journals. She got the movement noticed by the press. She was outspoken and impatient. And she really did the most to propel the movement um, forward way more than people realize today because she was very unpopular within the movement uh, with the, her fellow women because she had a bad temperament, right? Because she had this anger and she didn't care about what some people thought. She was seen as a liability rather than an asset at the time. Uh, she was pushed out of several organizations that she spearheaded. So I really feel bad for Sophia. I, it's, it's, it's a sad story um, for her. I felt like she got a bum deal. But I really think that um, our society's acceptance of women as doctors would have taken a lot longer if it hadn't been for Sophia. So these three women all took very different paths to get their MDs uh, with varying levels of frustration and sexism along the way. Elizabeth was turned down by about a dozen schools uh, in the US. One of her mentors said that she should go to France and disguise herself as a man to get her medical degree. And she was like, no, the whole point is to get a degree as a woman and be the first woman to get a medical degree. So no, I'm not doing that. Uh, finally, she got accepted to uh, Geneva College uh, in New York. But that was actually a fluke that she was accepted at all. Uh, the dean didn't want to be the one to tell her no because the dean was friends with her, one of her mentors. So he, he left it up to the students. He was like, okay, students, should we let a woman into medical school? And they, the students thought it was a joke from a rival college, like pretending to be a woman wanting to go to medical school. So they said, yes, sure, whatever, she can come. And then a few weeks later, here's an actual woman appears at the college. Surprise, there's Elizabeth. They were, they were totally shocked. They didn't know what they'd done. But they were much more accepting of her than some of the um, other women uh, were, were at their own colleges because they, they eventually sort of saw her as an older sister type figure. So she had a little bit of trouble with uh, some, some sexism, but not, not as much in what she did finally get into school. <laughs> so she was the first woman MD in the US when she graduated in 1849. And they brought some really intense scrutiny on Geneva College for you know, allowing this to happen. And so they closed their doors to, to women. They No more women were allowed to enter Geneva College after she graduated. So over in the UK, uh, medical schools are often attached to hospitals. So Lizzie um, started working as a nurse, right? She went into the hospital um, and then she would take a few classes while she was work doing nurse training. Um, but she kept getting kicked out of these various schools because she'd be like, okay, I want to take another class. What about this class? And they kind of got wise to what she was doing and would kick her out because she, um, they're like, no, no, you can't, you can actually be a student here. That's not okay. Um, so a lot of her education was gained through, she would meet um, professors through these, you know, going to these different um, colleges that were attached to, to hospitals. So she would find people that would give her private tutoring. Uh, so she, whatever credit she needed in whatever class, she would have them come to her home and do basically like a private teaching so she could get credit for that class. Um, 
at one of the schools, the students petitioned um, for her to get, be removed because she kept scoring higher than them on all the exams, <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> making them look bad. And she published a case study in a medical journal about one of the hospital's patients. And that was the last straw. They're like, no, you can't, this is not cool. You can't be better than us and be publishing stuff. So you got to go. So she took the um, a licensure exam via the Society of Apothecaries, which would get you a license to practice medicine in the UK. And she passed that easily and had all the credit she needed. Um, but as soon as she got that licensure, the society changed its rules to forbid further women from being able to get licensed through them. So you see the theme here, as soon as one woman slipped through a crack uh, in the system, those, those doors uh, were firmly closed behind them. So no one could repeat uh, what these women did. So it was really tricky for everyone. Even, like you think you're paving the way, right? But you're actually like closing the door behind you, unfortunately. So Sophia, uh, she was one of the people in Edinburgh at the riot. Um, that I talked about earlier. So she approached the University of Edinburgh Medical School who said they can't afford to take her on as a student because they have to create a whole separate classes. For each class you need, they have to be a separate class just for women, right? The case you can't join the classes because that wouldn't be okay. They needed women only classes and they, that would be too much of an expense for them to have one for just one woman. So she found a newspaper editor uh, who published uh, a little article about how she's looking for more people to come join her at medical school. And she now had several women uh, who came and said to the school, okay, we're not just one woman anymore. You got to let us in now. <laughs> so they, they had to do it because she found more than one, one woman, right? Um, so that was their only excuse. So they had to do it now. Uh, so, but they, they just fought the whole time they were fighting tooth and nail at the, the university it was such a nightmare the professors um they a lot of them didn't want the women in the class so they could said you couldn't come to the class we're like not required to teach you uh so they they gave them the textbooks and said you can teach yourself um there was some uh other professors that did let them in and they had a fine time in their co-ed classes and they were there was no problem at all so i don't know what some of these people were thinking so these women got uh, top exam scores. Um, they were, you know, doing really well. They were clearly, there was nothing wrong with their brains. <laughs> they, they, they were proving that women could study science and medicine just as well as, as men could, that they, you know, it was not that women's brains were inferior or not suited to this because they were proving that that totally wrong. Um, so they spent several years completing all the requirements for the medical degrees at the University of Edinburgh and the university said, no, we're not gonna give you the, the degree or we refuse to award you your degree. Uh, even though they've done all the same stuff as the male medical students, they, just because they're women, they said, no, you can't, you can't have your degree. It wasn't only the students uh, who opposed women in medical school. Several of the women reported that professors and administrators were joining in the riots, um, were like throwing stuff and yelling at them. Um, and the two riots I talked about were not the only two riots, unfortunately. There was riots at uh, a school in New York also. It was, it was not a fun time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, many of these doctors had no qualms about telling these women to their faces that they didn't belong in medical school. They had no business being there. They railed about them in medical journals. Uh, they, uh, it was, you know, they, it wasn't just their peers, it was their professors also. So I really wanted to highlight these seemingly insurmountable sexist opposition uh, that these women had to overcome. But also I, I had to mention that it wasn't all men who did this, right? <laughs> uh, there were some of those professors, there were some of those fellow students who would argue on their behalf, who would help them when, you know, people were attacking them physically and verbally, um, who gave them private lessons when they needed it, uh, when these institutions wouldn't allow them in. So there were those few men that helped them along the way. Um, and there were also plenty of women that were opposed to women doctors. You know, they were invested in the status quo and they just, they didn't want that to be upended. They didn't believe that women could be good doctors. This was just something that men and women believed at the time. So these early medical women were fighting stereotypes and myths uh, 
to help women be seen as equals who were capable of pursuing any career they wanted, right? They wanted to see women reinstated in their place as, as healers and, and physicians. So one really interesting tidbit that I unearthed uh, when I was doing my research was that I thought was really fascinating. Um, nearly all of these women medical students um, talked about in their writings, they talked about having a moment uh, when they were really worried about how they would react to uh, their first dissection or their first surgical uh, experience. So that was like the big, you know, rite of passage in medical school. So they, they were really worried that maybe society was gonna be right, that as women, they, they wouldn't, weren't gonna be able to handle these more gruesome aspects of medical training and medical practice. But what was really cool is that each one of them reported back saying that rather than being disgusting or that they were disgusted and couldn't handle it, they found the inner workings of the human body just absolutely exquisite. Uh, and they were enamored with its delicate, complicated engineering. And they just, you know, were really enthralled with it. So it kind of just really reinforced their choice uh, of profession and that they, you know, they could do this and that women could do this. But I just thought that was really interesting. So when it came time for these three women to find a job, no hospitals or medical establishments of any kind would hire them. Um, so they, all three of them independently established their own private practices, um, but they knew each other at the time, but they weren't like buddy, buddy. They were, they were each had their own independent private practice. Um, and for a lot of them, business was a little bit slow at first because everyone's a little bit, you know, like, oh my gosh, a woman doctor, I don't know about that. But then, um, a lot of these women set up free or low cost um, medical uh, services for women in poorer neighborhoods, immigrant neighborhoods. So these women didn't care if you were a woman doctor or a man doctor, they, they just cared about getting care. So, you know, that's where their, their business started booming is when they found these women that uh, really needed them. So eventually all three women independently uh, expanded their um, private practices to be uh, thriving women's hospitals. They, the need for women doctors to treat women was, was enormous and it was finally realized. Um, so Elizabeth with her sister, Emily, who also became a doctor and Marie Zakshevska, who we talked about earlier, they founded the women's hospital uh, in New York and then added a women's medical college where Sophia studied briefly. This is uh, Lizzie's new hospital for women in London. Her private practice um, expanded into a hospital. And this is Sophia Jex Blake's Edinburgh Hospital and Dispensary for Women and Children that later became Brunsfield Hospital in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, actually, Marie moved to Boston and was very successful at the women's hospital there. So Sophia, had the idea for a women's medical school in London. It was her, you know, going through this business at the University of Edinburgh and still not having her degree. That was like, okay, I give up. She, the goal always was to have co-ed education, right? That they, they really wanted just to be accepted by the establishment, but they, they, it wasn't happening it, as fast as they wanted it to. So like, okay, we're going to have to have our own separate education this you know we're, we're just not they're not going to accept us right now we're going to have to uh, deal with that uh, accept that and move forward um on our own so she invited elizabeth blackwell and lizzie garrett anderson to join her uh, in establishing this medical college So this is uh, Lizzie and her husband, their engagement photo. There's no touching at all. I love that. <laughs> this with her daughter who actually wrote um, 
uh, her biography, which I, I relied on a lot. Um, she copied a lot of Elizabeth's letters uh, into the biography. So that was really, really helpful for me. Um, but at the time being an independent woman, uh, trying to, you know, defeat social norms and push into a new profession. It was, it was really going to put a damper on your, your marriage opportunities. Right. So Elizabeth never got married. She was, uh, attracted to a, a few doctors along the way, but she just never settled down. Um, Sophia had a first love that went sour and then she finally settled down with, um, her, a female partner later on in Edinburgh, um, who was a, another former medical student. Um, and her, her partner actually wrote her biography. So that was also handy. She published her, some of her diaries in there. So uh, Lizzie received four marriage proposals uh, and did finally accept one. So she was, you know, her uh, efforts to be feminine and fancy worked out for her. And she, you know, she happily married. But her relationship was publicly put under a microscope. It was a big deal. So there were lots of articles in medical journals who were just, they were seriously discussing how she, um, how in the world this was just going to work. Like this would be a big test of could a woman have a job and a family, like, you know, what, what was going to happen. But she and her husband had a very progressive relationship at the time. Two people going to work was very, very modern idea. Like this was not something that happened. Right. Um, but Lizzie finally, you know, she, she was the proof that, that uh, you, you could have it all um, to an extent. <laughs> she also had a nanny, so <laughs> there's that. Uh, she had three children um, and her daughter became a surgeon and physician also. And her daughter was one of the women that uh, pioneered the idea of women doctors also treating men. So this is uh, live footage of me. Uh, we're working on my second book right now. No, um, <laughs> this was this was a lot, you know, a lot of research. There's a lot of history here. Um, my original book proposal had originally had, had a lot more women in it. I wanted to do more of a survey um, because I wanted to include more of those women in Philadelphia near where I live. Uh, but I chose to focus on these three women because I wanted to tell this really intriguing story of how they came together uh, to, to found this first medical school for women in, in London. This is me in Edinburgh doing research. Um, I read all the primary documents I could get my hands on. Uh, a lot of the archival documents have been digitized. Uh, so that was really handy that I didn't have to travel uh, to the, all those places. But I did go to New York, London, and Edinburgh to get in-person archives. I went to museums and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, it was right before the pandemic. So I got to freely <laughs> explore and travel. It was great. Uh, it was really electrifying to hold in my hands, letters that these women had written themselves. Um, it, you know, for the, for three years, these women just kind of like lived in my head, took up space. It, so to to see and hold something that they had touched was absolutely incredible. Um, I approached the the research like like the journalist I, I was trained to be. Uh, so when you write a profile as a journalist, you interview that person if you can. You interview their friends and their relatives, their enemies, their detractors, uh, all the press accounts you can of that person. So I found a lot of books and essays and letters and diary entries um, written by the women themselves. That was like the primary, right? That's the, the, the source. Um, I found a lot of biographies written by sisters, partners, children. Elizabeth Blackwell's sister wrote a lot of essays about her um, and all, what she was doing for women. So that was really handy. Um, I, my training as in journalism gave me a really great ear for quotes. So I was really, I felt like I was really good at picking out, um, the pieces of information that told you the most about what they were like as a person, um, to, that told you about the, the speaker and the subject. And, uh, when you're writing historical nonfiction, uh, 
any firsthand quotes are, are incredible, right? And just like firsthand descriptions of events, uh, they're, they're gold uh, to create some action. So I was very excited by how many scenes and how much dialogue I was able to recreate through these uh, firsthand accounts and letters. Um, so one of the difficulties I faced in writing about these women was that Sophia requested that all her papers be destroyed upon her death. So that's a pretty common thing um, that history writers come across. So, but like I said, her partner wrote a biography of her um, right after she passed away and they had a lot of direct quotes and diary entries. So the stuff that she, I don't know if she destroyed it after that or, or she just like pick and chose what she wanted to include, but her partner did destroy all the originals after she finished writing it. So there really wasn't a whole lot of Sophia in the archives. Um, but I did find diaries and papers from her friends and some of her fellow female students from the University of Edinburgh. So I could sort of paint a picture of her life and what her friends thought of her and what student life was like uh, for them. Sophia also published a lot of her own essays. Uh, like I said, she was a loud mouth, so she liked to get her stuff out there. Um, but it's interesting to me that she chose to have her papers destroyed because she was so outspoken. I guess she just wanted to control how she was remembered by, by future generations. So that was really interesting to me. So I was really interested in balancing the biographical narrative with discussions of the practice of medicine in the Victorian era. I am a science journalist first, so I, I didn't want this to be purely biography, but also not purely science. Uh, I wanted it to, to combine both. Um, I wanted you to come away from the book with some idea of what it would have been like to go visit the doctor uh, or check into a hospital in the Victorian era, which was not great, right? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was some some crazy stuff going on. But uh, this is actually a really, really fascinating period in the history of medicine because it was, there's a lot of innovation going on, a lot of discoveries being made. So it's sort of like the switching from the dark ages of bloodletting and purging and unmedicated surgery. Uh, we're giving way to this light of antisepsis and anesthesia, germ theory, and medications that actually could help you and not just poison you. Um, so it, it's, it's a really crucial time and it was a lot of fun to uh, to use these women as like an entryway into this period of medicine. Um, so when you look at how far medicine came in such a short period of time, it's it's really miraculous. Um, and it's, it's, it's really cool to watch it through these women's eyes and see how Elizabeth Blackwell was sort of in this old school and then the younger women were uh, part of the newer school of being open to um, more invasive surgeries and more, you know, progressive ideas about about things. What's ironic is that um, because they faced so much sexism, a lot of these early medical women were forced to travel to mainland Europe um, to seek education and training. Uh, a lot of them did like postgrad work. So uh, places like France, Germany, Switzerland, th these were a huge hotbed of medical innovation during this time. Uh, so these women were bringing back cutting edge treatments uh, to the US and the UK because they were forced out uh, to these other countries to, for their extended training. So when Marie Zakshevska started working at the Women's Hospital in Boston, the head doctor balked at her request for these newfangled European instruments. He was like, no, we're not having that junk here. That's, that's fancy stuff. So these women uh, went on to help popularize preventative medicine, uh, regular prenatal and postnatal care, uh, social work, antiseptic practices in uh, the US and in the UK. They changed the fields of medicine by bringing women back into the profession uh, and helping to learn a lot more about women's illnesses. Women could now perform medical research of their own to, to debunk men's theories about female biology. They could question these dubious claims doctors had about how women's bodies worked and investigate the real culprits, right, that they suspected were actually the cause uh, of women's illnesses. So uh, a lot of men, doctors just thought that women bodies were like that you're just like more prone to cancer or whatever just if the cancer was a feminine thing that was just how it was but these women 
being scientists themselves could now go in and say, okay, you know what? It's because these women are pregnant all the time. That's why they're sick. Or it's because they're wearing these, this heavy restrictive clothing. That's why they're, they're sick all the time. This, these women are working in unsafe factory conditions or um, being sexually abused in the domestic service. That's why, you know, they're sick all the time. These women uh, from birth on experience these sexist social norms that encourage men, but not women to exercise and run around and play. Uh, so these women were uh, some of the early proponents of encouraging active physical play for girls uh, in schools as well as boys, like PE for girls. This is like, these women were like, look, girls need to be playing and running around just like boys are. So Mary Putnam Jacoby, who was a professor at the Blackwell's uh, Medical School in New York, she did some research studies to prove that women were not any weaker during their period and uh, that performing physical and mental labor during this time had no effect on them and did not render them feeble-minded or sterile. So, you know, she just totally debunked uh, this reason for keeping them out of education. So no one would have blamed these women <laughs> for stopping quitting at any time, right? Given the constant sexism and lack of support, uh, I cannot imagine doing this. Um, but they chose not just to pursue their own goals and achieve them, but they went even further and decided to establish medical colleges just for women so that other women didn't have to go through what they did. They were absolutely pivotal in opening the medical profession to women elevating the quality of women's health care. They brought health care to women and women to health care. Most of all, they proved that to the world, women could be doctors and surgeons and great ones. I hope that hearing the, about the history of what women had to endure to become doctors in the Victorian era can help all modern medical professionals uh, realize the importance of continuing to advocate for more opportunities for women and everyone, for a matter of fact, not just medical professionals. So now I have the depressing charts portion of the uh, presentation. <laughs> um, women are still underrepresented, underrepresented in leadership positions. Several medical specialties remain boys clubs. Too many women doctors continue to report experiencing sexism. So in my opinion, we owe it to these early trailblazers to do everything within our power to stamp out sexism in medicine that continues today. So that's my three main women um, in their older years. Uh, they all lived to be old and fabulous. <laughs> I believe Lizzie was the first mayor of an English, first woman mayor of an uh, English town where she grew up. So. That's the end. Thank you guys so much.